Back pain isn't new, but there are some therapies that are. Oh, my aching back. Tonight on Call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. I'm Dr. Andrew Ellsworth, your Prairie Doc this evening. A healthy, pain-free back is important for a positive quality of life. We often take it for granted until it doesn't work. But first, a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. True or false? Surgery is the most common treatment for chronic back pain. True or false? We'll have the answer later in the program. Joining us tonight in the studio is Dr. Adil Sheikh of Avera Medical Group Physical Medicine and Rehab, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Hi. And remotely via Zoom is Dr. Tyler Tachek of Rapid City Medical Center and member of the Monument Health Medical Staff. Welcome, Hi. Good evening. Dr. Tachek and Dr. Sheikh. Uh, Dr. Sheikh, tell us a little bit about yourself, if you don't mind, your background, and what do you do as a physician? Well, thank you. It's good to be here. I um, grew up in Canada, in Toronto, and uh, I've been with Avera for about eight, nine years. I trained at the University of Toronto in physical medicine and rehab, and then moved to Sioux Falls to work with Avera. So at Avera, I work in the physical medicine and rehab clinic, along with the Avera McKinnon Hospital and the uh, Avera inpatient acute in inpatient rehab unit. So as a physical medicine rehab doctor, what, what do you do for patients? So it's, it's, it's a lot of different things, but the, the bottom line would be I try to help them recover from pain and improve their function. So it would include a lot of different diagnoses, including stroke, brain injuries, sports medicine, car accidents, musculoskeletal injuries, amongst others. Very good. And uh, Dr. Tachek, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice. Yes, sir. Thank you, Andrew, for uh, organizing everything. Uh, so my name is Tyler Tachek. I'm from uh, Northeast Nebraska originally. I um, come from a family of uh, family physicians, actually. I did a residency at the Nebraska Medical Center in anesthesiology and was lucky enough to be exposed to pain management as a subspecialty. And I uh, recently moved to Rapid City after completing the fellowship. Um, I have experience uh, four years in um, Missouri. Um, my background, uh, like Dr. Sheik's, is to try to identify the cause of the pain and then to offer a solution um, that's common sense. Um, what are some examples of some of the things you, some of the solutions you might might come up with? Yeah, absolutely. So I like to figure out um, with physical exam and history what the most likely cause of the pain would be and then start with basic non-opiate medicines and get the patient into physical therapy or occupational therapy as soon as possible. That's I often find that um, patients uh, develop pain syndromes or chronic pain when they don't use the body normally. And sometimes just getting them to the right person to teach them what's wrong is very important. Uh, I definitely want to get into that more, too, as we get into the show. Um, so, you know, just starting out, um, and, and you brought this up, we want to look at the cause of the pain. Um, Adel, wh what are some of the uh, causes of back pain? Well, if you look at the research out there, whether it's the New England, New England Journal of Medicine or the Annals of Internal Medicine, 85% of the time, people's cause of the back pain is going to be myofascial pain. So muscle strains, injuries to the ligaments in there. You have about 10% of the time where you have kind of moderately serious issues, maybe vibral fractures. Ridiculous. Broke their back, basically. Right, they yeah. broke their back, or their nerves getting pinched in their back, or other genetic issues that could be causing it. And then you have one percent of back pain, typically in general, has been found to be very serious things. Whether it's a uh, part of their spinal cord getting compressed, or whether they have cancer in their back, or they have a really bad infection in their back. So those would be the big three criteria I would describe them as. Sure. Um, and so how do you 
uh, help determine what's the cost. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what Tyler said too. I mean, you have to, number one, do a history. You know, so all those really bad things may have some, some clues on history that will determine whether they're really bad or benign that most back pain is. Um, so for example, if you, have in, if you have a fever, if you have a history of drug abuse, you know, if, you ha if you're immunocompromised, then you a, then a you, poor immune system you're on medication for thank you something that, yes yeah, you're sorry fine. yeah you're fine if those are the issues you're thinking yeah. maybe there is a sign of there is a chance of infection um if you have a history of cancer or current cancer back is a very common place for cancer to be if you have signs where you know your muscles are getting weak and you can't control your bladder or bowel you can't feel when you wipe yourself that tells me, okay, maybe part of your core is getting compressed. So that, those are the bad things. As long as you kind of identify the bad things and you say, okay, I don't think it's going to be too bad, then you're left with you know, a very likelihood chance that it is a benign type of back pain. So Tyler, let's say, well, first of all, you know, if that's the case, if we want to rule out these bad things, why don't we do an x-ray every time someone comes in with back pain right away? Good question. So um, we try to utilize images um, appropriately. So if there's a change in the pain or if there is a warning sign, um, like Otto said, you know, cord compression signs or fever and, and pain in the back, we try to use um, the x-rays and MRIs, but we try to limit them at the same time. So a lot of medical imaging is implicated in causing some harm. So we want to try to limit those to, you know, changes or very bad warning signs. That's when we would deploy an image. Um, if you have back pain for weeks, uh, it's not responding to normal things, or you have one of the warning signs, then it's, it's acceptable to start with an x-ray. How can getting an x-ray be harmful? Uh, x-ray um, x -ray technology has been around for 80, 90, 100 years. Um, but it uses actual energy sources uh, that can change our genetic code. And if you're exposed to too many of these dangerous, potentially dangerous um, rays, then it can uh, lead you to a higher chance of cancer later on. So an X-ray is very safe. Uh, they're very limited in how many doses you uh, expose yourself to. But the important thing is to not get exposed to those on a daily or weekly basis. Can I add some more stuff yes, to that? And you. Tyler is absolutely correct. But I will add two more points to that. So number one, when we do imaging on patients, we're bound to find them some things that are wrong. So about 70% of the population, and this kind of goes up exponentially with age. If you image someone, you're going to find something wrong, whether or not that's actually related to the pain at all. And then you're using you know, resources of the healthcare system. And, and typically, you know, you want to use resources when they're appropriate, but there's really good meta-analysis studies out there that show that if you've had x-rays in the first few weeks, whether it's six weeks, four weeks, or, or any other imaging, MRI, CT scans, it makes no difference on how you're going to do later on in the future. So again, you're wasting resources, and like Tyler says, you know, they, you know, if, if you're not getting better, that's a good time to come out think of imaging because you may be uh, not thinking of something on your physical examination history that may show up on the imaging. So, you know, you mentioned you might, we might find things incidentally, you know, just by chance because we did that x-ray. But, you know, it would seem that, oh, well, that's a good thing. Now we found that out. But... As you know, you know, that can lead to more and more other tests and procedures and then other complications. Or we worry about uh, some sort of cyst or something seen on the imaging, and then and the, now we have to biopsy it. And in the end, turns out everything was fine and nothing to worry about. And, and that's the case for majority. And meanwhile, there's all the anxiety and worry that comes mm -hmm. from these added things and the cost and the, and, and so it, 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 we try not to over medicalize mm -hmm. early on when something's going on and we want to get down to the actual cause and the actual source. 
Um, I, we'll definitely dive into that pretty soon. I want to cut to our first, first roll in here. And if you've ever suffered from back pain, you know how all consuming it can be. It's tempting to reach for a pill, get a shot, or even watch surgery to make the pain go away. However, they are not always the answer, as Brookings resident Diane Underwood found out. She shared her story with On Call co-producer Ginger Thompson. Four and a half years ago, I woke up one morning and fell onto the floor. I had extreme sciatic pain going from my butt to my knee. I'd never had anything like that in my life. I called my chiropractor right away and went into him. And then I went directly to my medical doctor and he prescribed some pain medication. And it continued just to hurt 24 seven. I went to a massage therapist. I even went to Sioux Falls for three weeks of acupuncture treatments. I bought an inversion table. Um, I, I tried everything. After six months of unrelenting pain, Diane Underwood consulted a Sioux Falls neurosurgeon who ultimately performed surgery on her back. And I woke up from my back surgery and my sciatic pain was gone, but I had excruciating low back pain. Now I have never had low, low back pain in my life and it was unbelievable. She sought help at the Mayo Clinic, where doctors told her to do Pilates, build her core, swim, try yoga, and get massages. Well, that is not really what I wanted to hear. I wanted them to fix me, and I think I cried all the way back to Brookings. Today, two and a half years after going to Mayo, hot tubbing, swimming, and especially yoga have allowed her to function normally. When her back pain flares, which it occasionally does, she doesn't reach for a pill. Instead, she turns to exercises in her favorite book, titled The Younger Next Year Back Book. Diane practices many types of yoga, including restorative, yin, gentle, hatha, online classes, yoga on the beach, and even aerial yoga with silks. I went on a yoga cruise last year, a five-day cruise where we did yoga. <laughs> I think I went to six yoga classes a day. We did them out by the pool. We did them, oh, it was, I met so many great yogi friends um, all over the United States. So, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities. Find something, I mean, if you love to cruise, find a yoga cruise. I mean, don't be intimidated by it. Uh, we all start with just, you know, you, you'll learn it. I've got my husband now doing yoga with me because he does it here with the computer. I haven't been able to get to him to go to a class, but he does do yoga with me because he's real tight and he has back issues and he needs it. I, I think everybody needs yoga. So I've, I've become a big believer. That has been my, my lifesaver. I really believe that it has really gotten my life back. I've got my life back because I do yoga. Wow, I'm really glad that uh, she found yoga. That sure seemed to work for her. Um, you know, Adil, how many pe have, have you found yoga to be helpful for many people? Are, are there some people you wouldn't recommend do yoga? Absolutely, very good question. I would say if you are having acute back pain, so acute means the back pain is less than four weeks old, um, you probably shouldn't start doing yoga. You need your back to heal first. but in that subacute and mostly chronic phase of back pain, yoga is very beneficial. There's a lot of different things yoga helps you do, including stretching, exercise, increasing your range of motion, strengthening your core. In fact, there's a lot of physiatrists that strongly recommend yoga. The evidence is there, although the studies are not the best. I actually have one of my partners in my clinic that has trained to be a yoga instructor just for this very cause. <laughs> Tyler, um, so going back to when someone first gets back pain, so we might not recommend yoga right away. What do, what should we do right away? What is recommended? Good question. So someone shows up to my office um, with acute back pain, so pain lasting for weeks. Um, we first of all rule out all, the, all of the bad things or all of the things that could cause permanent damage. 
Um, and what I typically start on is um, a medicine called meloxicam, which is basically prescription ibuprofen or prescription Motrin, you know, depending on how old the patient is and how, how, uh, how many other risk factors they have, such as heart disease and kidney disease. A lot of times having that NSAID and maybe even a muscle relaxer will allow them to get back to functioning somewhat normally. Um, that's important so that they don't stress out other parts of the body. So it's, it's fairly common. I see mostly patients who've had pain for six months or longer, and they got into that syndrome because they did not use their body correctly when they had the acute pain or the pain that started and lasted, you know, only would have lasted a few weeks if they would have um, gotten the proper medicine and proper care to start with. So if it's early on and uh, I want my body to kind of heal up, I just overdid it with the heavy snow that we, we got, um, is it better for me to lay on the couch and, or is it better for me to be doing something and taking ibuprofen or, or what? That's a good question. So I'm a firm believer in uh, the body knows what is too much. So I typically tell people to do what is tolerated um, laying for too long is not good, but also trying to run a marathon after you hurt your back is also not too good. So listen to your body. Um, if something really hurts, then take it easy. And if, if you can progress into a slow type of walking routine and stretch, stretching routine, I think that's very appropriate. When should someone come in to their doctor after having an episode of back pain? So things we worry about are extreme and unrelenting pain despite stretches. We worry about changes in your bowel or your bladder. We worry about a numbness um, in the groin area. And we also uh, worry about extreme weakness of the leg or if you drag your foot when you're walking. Those are things that require uh, immediate attention. Um, so let's say someone stayed home and they've been trying to stay active and they've been taking ibuprofen. Adele, what would you recommend um, now if they've come in to see you and it's been, you know, a month or two or six months or maybe not that long, but anyway, several weeks of back pain. What would you recommend for them at that point? Well, and, and I got to say, Tyler is absolutely on point with that. You know, I think I, I would also want to second that, you know, and taking an NSAID such as naproxen or meloxicam is what's recommended, which is different from sometimes when people expect to get opioids. And I want to just lay that out there because sometimes people think about that. Um, the studies show that there is no difference whether you take that, the, the anti-inflammatory medication or opioids. Um, now, keeping moving is very important, just like Tyler said, and if they keep moving, studies have shown that it's actually really good for them. Those people that sit and lay down in bed, it's bad for them. Now, if they've been moving, like you said, and they've been taking their NSAIDs and being as active as they can, along with potentially a muscle relaxant, they come in, what we wanna do is make sure that there's nothing scary on the history, there's nothing scary on the physical examination. So scary are things, again, like Tyler mentioned, Things that give us worry, whether it's an infection, signs of fracture, you know, signs of uh, cancer, uh, signs of uh, cord compromise. Um, and so those signs of cord compromise again are what? So those are, that's very good. So a, a signs of cord compromise would be retention of their bladder. So they cannot pee. And that's typically uh, a problem. Uh, and it's, it's important to be objective in it. So sometimes you may want to scan the bladder after they pee because sometimes people get a sensation that they're not peeing properly, but it may not be the case. So they can't pee. They cannot control their bowel. The, when they try to have a bowel movement, they cannot control that bowel sphincter that they have. Um, their legs start getting weaker. So those are all signs of, and, and then they can't feel when they wipe themselves. So those are the signs that, you know what, their cord may be getting compromised. What, when do you start to recommend physical therapy? So physical therapy uh, should start after about the four weeks time frame because most people will get better. About 60% will get, get better by four weeks. Maybe 80% may get better by six weeks, regardless of what they do, as long as they're active and do the right things. 
So then you start physical therapy now. You're going to have two sects of people that are going to go to physical therapy. One sect that's starting to get better. And those people can work on exercises and other things that the physical therapist can give, show you. But the other sect are going to come in and say, look, I'm in so much pain, I can't go to physical therapy. But there's other things that physical therapists can do. They can help you deal with the pain better. They can provide appropriate education. They can provide you with ways that you can um, work towards getting better at your daily activities. And number two, they can do things that may help with the pain. There's spinal mobilization and that has some evidence. Massage always makes people feel better, even though objectively the studies have not shown that it helps with the pain. And then they can use other modalities in physical therapy, heat, tens, ultrasound, to see if they can relax the muscles, you know, relax your back and start to make you feel a bit better. Do you ever recommend ice or heat, or when do you recommend one or the other? So typically, in acute back pain, heat is what's shown to have evidence for making people feel better. As you know, cold is going to numb the nerves and make that pain feel better also. But typically, we prefer heat because it's going to make them feel better, relax the muscles. The cold may have a tendency to contract the muscles. They may have other side effects from cold. And then lastly, um, cold does not have as much evidence, but some people will say, you know what, I put an ice pack and that made me feel good. There's really no harm in them doing that if it does actually make them feel good. Okay. So Tyler, now someone's been doing physical therapy and they just aren't getting anywhere. Um, where, what do you recommend usually in that situation? Yeah, good question. So first of all, I just want to echo uh, what Otto said. So I um, love to send people to physical therapy because they get better most of the time. They come back and they thank me. Um, they're worried about not getting better and most of the time it happens. And what I usually tell patients is that Physical therapy, if you go to it and you pay attention and you ask questions, it's like taking a college class on how your body is acting and it's not acting normally. So go, go to physical therapy, learn from the physical therapist, learn about how your body's not acting normally and try to get it back to normal function. Um, the question you asked about what to do after physical therapy is very important, uh, but it involves a, an ever decreasing amount of patients uh, who get to that point. So what I typically do after physical therapy, um, I again do a physical exam. It's almost always different from the first time I see them. So I'll test their reflexes, I'll push on their muscles, I'll see what their range of motion is. And then based on that, I'll typically recommend an x-ray uh, that shows their spine in motion, or I'll recommend an MRI, which is uh, short for uh, magnetic resonance imaging. It uses um, a, a source of energy that actually uh, does not emit radiation, and it shows the bones, muscles, ligaments, tendons, discs, nerves, spinal cord, spinal fluid. It is a, an amazing image modality. Um, after I get the image, then I'll see the patient back and I'll correlate everything that we've found with the image as best as possible. When would you get a CT scan? And what's the difference between that and, and, and an MRI? I actually order very few CT scans uh, because they do not show the detailed anatomy like an MRI does. Um, they are a lot of radiation, but it is an amazing tool um, in places with limited resources. So in really small towns, they often do have a CT scanner um, when I need to find something really quick, when there is a certain change or I suspect a fracture, a, a broken bone, then a CT scan is a wonderful tool because it's quick. It's, um, uh, it's good when patients can't lay on the table for a long time. So it usually takes about five minutes and it shows a lot of information. But typically I don't order a lot of uh, CT scans unless there's an emergency situation um, or I suspect a very specific problem that a CT scan can show. I will say that, um, echoing what Tyler said, but I'll add that, uh, you know, sometimes when people have vertebral fractures, so fractures of the spine, 
Sometimes a CT scan can depict the fracture a little mm -hmm. bit better. Mm -hmm. The other only reason I would think about not doing an MRI over a CT scan is if somebody has metal or pacemakers that are not compatible. So, you know, when they do an MRI, they have this screening form. And so there's a whole bunch of questions. And number one is metal in their body, pacemakers, other stims. And I know Tyler do, may talk about stims later, but, um, you know, if they have some of those that are not compatible, then you may want to do a CT. So if a patient has back pain that's radiating down the leg or, and or causing numbness uh, and, and or tingling, you know, you, you, you know, there's probably some sort of pressure being put on a nerve. And an x-ray is maybe not going to show that. An MRI could show that. But is there any harm in not getting an MRI right away to help find out what's going on with the nerve? Or, or should we have an MRI right away to find out what's going on? Well, so, okay, um, is, is there any harm? I think, I think definition of harm is a little uh, yeah. subjective, but I would say that, like I said, um, studies have shown whether you get an MRI or you don't get an MRI, if you don't have worrisome causes, it's not gonna change anything in terms of outcome. And this is, you know, JAMA studies that have been done on this. And, and when I say worrisome causes, I talk, uh, it's the same red flags that Tyler and I mentioned. It's not necessarily radiculopathy. Okay. So, you know, an MRI may be useful if, you know, Tyler wants to do an epidural injection or if a surgeon wants to do a, a surgery right away. But, you know, it, it may or may not be the first step after the six weeks. So, yes, you know, they have radiating pain going down the leg. But you could try other medications also, um, such as neuropathic pain medications that may help. Now, the other thing I would say is, and I see this very common in our, in, and Tyler probably does too in, in our practice, there's lots of different things that can cause pain radiating down your leg. And it may not be a nerve getting pinched. So that's one of the biggest issues I see when patients come in and they're so worried. And, and they, they say, hey, doc, you know, this, I, have a, I have a really bad nerve getting pinched going down my leg. But it could be a lot of different things. It could be a hip problem. It could be an SI joint problem. It could be, you know, if, if you have- the SI joint. What? It's a sacroiliac. So there's these two, the, the, the sacrum is a bone in the body and the ilium is a bone in the body. So if you have a joint problem in there, you could have pain going down the leg. Or the hip connects to the spine, basically. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some muscular problems cause pain going down the leg. You know, if you have some sort of abdominal issue, sometimes they refer down the leg. Um, if you have a urinary tract infection, it can go down to the groin and thigh area. If you have, um, if you have uh, other abdominal issues like a pancreas issue or a gallbladder issue, you can have pain in your back that feels like it's going down towards your hip area. So just because you have pain going down the leg doesn't necessarily mean they need an MRI of their lumbar spine. You know, we'll have to use some clinical judgment there to see what's the best thing for this patient. Sure. You know, it's important to find out where a patient's back pain is, but it's also critical to find out why the patient has that pain. Prairie Doc reporter Tori Burnt spoke with a physical therapist about back pain management. Back pain could have many, many different sources and causes. So typically when I'm evaluating and treating somebody, I'm trying to identify which specific mechanism or which specific physiological process may be going on. And then I go after that. I don't necessarily just go after the region. Um, when I get a diagnosis or somebody comes to me with an order um, to see them for back pain, that just tells me where they hurt. It doesn't tell me why they hurt or what we should do to help them move forward with that. So, you know, there's, there's kind of three main pain mechanisms. One of them is nociceptive. So you can think that's like a tissue issue. So that's you know, on a lovely day like today where we get a bunch of snow, there's a lot of people out there with shovels and um, then they get some sore backs because their muscles and ligaments and everything is just probably not used to that type of exercise. You know, that's just not a really common thing that we do in our daily life um, is go out there and put, you know, 30, 40, 50 pounds at the end of a three foot long stick and then heave ho. And, and it's no surprise why people get sore backs this time of year when we get a winter storm. So just like if, 
you decided, all right, I'm going to run a 5K. You're not just going to wake up tomorrow and run a 5K, right? You're slowly going to work your way up and train. We don't really have the luxury of doing that necessarily when a big snowstorm comes. But um, part of that is just helping people make sense of that and why they hurt. Are there any stretches or anything that you advise patients to do when they have back pain? Yeah, I mean, that, that again is kind of on a case-by-case case individualized basis. There's really no evidence to suggest that there is for back pain, here's this recipe of five things you should do. Those articles kind of drive us insane. You could, I mean, literally go into Google and type in exercises for back pain and you will find 40,000 different articles of these are must-have exercises for your back. And we know that back pain is so multifactorial and um, there's really so much that goes into it that can potentially be good because you're moving and we know that tissues like blood flow and oxygen. So it's good from that standpoint. Um, but it can also set some people up to feel like damaged goods because this awesome article they found on the internet didn't help their back pain. And why did it not work for me? And it worked for my neighbor. You know, we got to be careful on taking blanket recommendations um, from an internet guideline or, or from an article. Um, they have their place, but um, they don't um, replace a healthcare professional's um, guidance regarding those things. Yeah, turning to the internet may be helpful sometimes to kind of supplement what your doctor's recommending, but it might not be the best way to find out what, what's recommended for your for your treatment plan. Um, so Tyler, uh, you know, we haven't talked about steroids yet. Could you tell us about steroids and how they help with back pain? Yeah, good question. So steroids are a very unique class of medicine that actually inhibit prostaglandin synthesis in the cell. Um, that's a fancy way of saying it shuts off um, inflammation at a totally different mechanism that ibuprofen or Motrin does. Um, it can rapidly decrease the inflammation, uh, but if there is a cause that is still causing the inflammation, that would likely come back. Um, steroids do have risks. I tell all my patients about that risk. Um, a lot of times when people have back pain, they get prescribed multiple steroid packs. And the risks of taking steroids more than four to five times a year is that it increases your risk of diabetes or makes diabetes worse because it prevents insulin from doing its job from getting the glucose into the muscle. Um, and then it also can make your bones weak. So these are all uh, double-edged swords. So if diabetes gets worse, then blood sugars go up and inflammation gets higher. And if your bones get weak, then you're more likely to have chronic pain if you have a fracture or if you have osteoporosis. Um, it can often, oftentimes cause advanced uh, or accelerated degeneration of the low back. And so, you know, sometimes we'll prescribe prednisone or a type of steroid orally as a pill to help calm down the back. Um, Tyler, when do you recommend a steroid injection and what are some of the benefits or, and harms of having a steroid injection? The so steroid injection, um, I typically prescribe if there is a very focal or very um, definite cause of the pain that has been identified. Um, usually we use steroid injections or epidural shots, um, or another, another way we call that. We use that if the pain is actually going down the leg or going down the arm, and we call that pain radicular pain or sciatica. Um, steroids are also utilized if there is a focal joint pain. So as Otto mentioned, the SI joint, which is that, that joint that supports the spine and, and actually supports the uh, connection between the hip and the spine, if that's inflamed, then oftentimes a steroid injection would be prescribed for that. If the pain is not focal, if the pain is un, of undetermined cause, then that's kind of when I would think about prescribing a steroid pack by mouth. And that means just taking pills for seven to 10 days to try to decrease the inflammation generally around the body. Uh, the risks of steroids, as we discussed, are um, numerous, but specific to injections. 
So anytime injections are prescribed, there's always a chance of bleeding or injuring a blood vessel. There's a chance of infection uh, with a needle introducing an infection into the spine or joint. There's a chance of reacting to the steroids. Um, and then there's a chance of, of, of having an overwhelming systemic response. So blood sugars go up so high that people have to go to the hospital for. You know, one thing I think of, uh, you know, of pain radiating down the leg is from a herniated disc. Could, Adil, could you tell me about what a herniated disc is and, and, and what, how that causes pain and, and how that's treated? Okay, so your back or spine is designed to have bones and gel type cushioning areas that are called discs. So if you have bones in your spine, and there's multiple bones that go all the way from your neck down to your sacrum area, which is your tailbone area. These little cushioning areas are spacers between the bones. Now, they are called the discs. These discs are somewhat round in shape, ovalish round in shape. And they have two parts. One is a fibrous layer that's on the outside. It's kind of like a, a car tire. You know, it's rough and, 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 and grainy. And, and tough. And then the, on the inside, you have a gelatinous layer, which is soft and squishy. And so this disc helps cushion the spine when you're walking, moving, lifting heavy things, having sudden movements, so you don't have too much pressure on the nerves that come out from the spine, but also you don't injure the bones in your spine. So when you have a disc herniation, that herniation means that disc is kind of pouching out. So there's different ways to classify disc herniations, but that's the simplest thing. The, the disc is poking out a little bit because it got too much pressure. The number one reason for that is when that rough area, the fibrous layer of that disc has a little tear in it. And so when it pokes out, it can pinch on the nerve that's coming out from the spinal cord or the spinal canal in your back. Very good, very good. And so how can we treat that? Or how, is, does a steroid injection help with that? Does, can it just calm down on its own over time? Or, or is surgery needed? Yeah, so for the most part, you do not need surgery. You do not need anything aggressive for it. A lot of people, regardless of whether they have a disc herniation or pain going down the leg, they do get better with, you know, if you go to therapy, like Tyler said, if you take the right medication. So if the anti-inflammatory doesn't work, if muscle relaxants don't work, because some of the muscle relaxants do have a pain modulating effect. Uh, then taking a neuropathic pain medication, what that is a fancy word for saying is the pain medication that kind of dulls the nerve type pain. So if they take those pain medications for some amount of time and it doesn't work, then yes, you know, you could look at other options such as epidurals, like Tyler said, or you can look at surgery if all else fails. But there's drawbacks for surgery and you don't necessarily want to look at that right away. Does, Tyler, how often does surgery help? Surgery is very helpful in certain circumstances. So weakness of the leg, or um, if patients get so weak that they're dragging their foot when they walk, also known as foot drop, surgery is absolutely important for that. Uh, also, if patients have failed everything, they've tried NSAIDs, they've tried physical therapy, they tried anti-membrane or membrane stabilizers, uh, medicines that calm the nerves down, epidural injections, and their body is not returning to normal function. Uh, surgery does have a role. And, and so, um, is, but is surgery always helpful? Surgery is not always helpful. Um, back surgery is typically um, good for radicular pain or pain that shoots down the leg or the arm that has failed conservative measures. It has somewhat mixed results for just low back pain or just pain that stays in the back. Um, surgery should be carefully weighed as an option. I tell my patients that uh, once you have back surgery, you can't go back. Uh, you can always go back to physical therapy. You can always stop doing steroid injections. 
but back surgery is an irreversible solution. Um, hopefully it makes the pain better, but we always try to use it as a last case resort. So an alternative solution are, are, are pain pumps. What is a, what is a pain pump and, and how, does, how does that work? That's a good question. So a pain pump is simply a device uh, that has a reservoir or a, um, a central container that actually has a pump in it that pumps a certain type of medicine into the spinal canal or the uh, fluid that surrounds the spinal nerves. It's the same fluid that surrounds the brain. And typically, if we deliver medicine into the spinal fluid, it has a different, a different mechanism than by taking medicines by mouth. So there are a number of medicines that we can put in a pain pump. We can use uh, a, a specialized medicine called Prealt, which is actually a uh, medicine that was derived from an underwater sea snail. Uh, we can use a numbing medicine, such as bupivacaine, to numb the nerves. We can use um, baclofen when someone has severe spasticity, uh, which means the muscles are tight and they won't relax. We can also use any uh, opiate that can be formulated into a, uh, a solution. So opiates such as uh, Dilaudid or morphine or fentanyl. Those typically at small doses do not cause side effects and have a much lower rate of addiction than taking medicines by, by mouth. We typically only elect to do pain pumps when, when there are no other options. So pain pumps are reserved uh, if patients are either too sick for surgery, don't want surgery, or have had surgery, and they still have terrible pain that limits their function. You know, it wasn't that long ago that if a patient came in, there's, there's maybe a lot of doctors that they just want to help the patient and they would prescribe them pain pills and the patients found that that helped their pain. But why wouldn't we want to do that, Dr. Shake? Well, so, okay, now you got to look at how long they've had the pain. So typically people that have acute pain um, you want to get them comfortable enough so that their back recovers because we know most of these do recover. So if you go down the flow chart of things that you want to do, uh, a pathway, um, so number one, we talked about the, the, uh, the anti-inflammatory medication. We talked about the muscle relaxers. We tried about the neuromodulators or the neuropathic pain medications. You know, it, if those don't work, you can you can and they are they're suffering really bad you can you can use the uh, uh, an opioid back in the day opioids uh, were publicized as harmless and now we know that opioids long term can cause significant issues whether it being addiction whether making the pain worse whether it's making your hormones all work different whether having issues, uh, causing issues with your sexual function, whether it changes, changes your body type. We know all these things now occur with yeah. opioids. So you want to reserve opioids for the people that absolutely cannot get help anywhere else. They should not be used on a chronic basis. The current guidelines say that if you are starting somebody on opioids, Start them on a slump, smaller opioid, so le, le, tramadol. It's a partial opioid, so it kind of works in an opioid way, but also has less addiction compared to other opioids, such as oxycodone and hydrocodone. You, just, you start them on a smaller opioid. On top of that, you want to have a definite amount of time. You want to say, look, these are our goals. Goal setting is very important when you start opioids. Current guidelines say, recommend three days so you can and and that could be extended for up to a week so typically what ends up happening is people sometimes forget to stop that they like how the opioids make them feel and so then they're on it indefinitely and then they don't necessarily recover from the pain because it's just something that covers it up can they have more pain because they've been used to taking opioid medication? Absolutely. It's a well-defined and studied phenomena, and it's called, called opioid-induced hyperalgesia. That basically means the opioids are causing all these nerves in your body to feel a lot more pain. And so the opioids themselves are the causative factor of pain. So then if they can 
wean themselves or get help getting off that opioid medication, they actually might end up being in the same amount of pain without the medicine as with the medicine. And a lot of my patients are exactly like that. So initially, when you start getting them off opioids, in the first week or two, they may say, Doc, I feel terrible. I feel like my pain's gone up significantly. And that's expected because these people are, their body is almost addicted, even though mentally and psychologically they may not be addicted. So addiction has all these different facets, but their body's addicted, so then they have increase in pain. The other thing that happens is they start having a little bit of withdrawal, and so that makes them feel bad. So they feel as though the pain is terrible in that first few weeks, but if they survive that, and if they, if they say, you know what, I'm going to do what my doc thinks is right, then a lot of them come back and say, thank you. Thank you for getting me off these things because now I feel like I'm free. Yeah, it's good. It's good. We only have a couple more minutes. Tyler, I wanted to ask about nerve stimulators too and how that can be helpful. Yeah, that's a great question. So I utilize a lot of nerve stimulators in my practice uh, when patients have constant pain, so pain that's there 24 seven. They go to sleep with the pain, they wake up with the pain, and it's typically of neuropathic origin, or that means it's coming from a nerve. So these patients have pain that's burning, tingling, numbing, sometimes stabbing. Uh, a lot of times these patients have had surgery or they've had such bad compression that even after a surgery opens up the area where the nerve lives, their nerves never recover. So they have chronic pain uh, that has failed all other courses. And a lot of times, if we can pl apply a small electrical stimulus to the spinal cord, then we can get these neurons to shut off and not allow the pain signals to get to the brain. It's actually one of the most uh, rewarding things that I can do in my job. It's, it's most of the time like a light switch. The patients will have the stimulator uh, trial, which means I implant two little leads in the back, two little wires, and I tape them to the skin uh, connected to a battery. They try it for a week and they come back and, and all smiles. They can finally do things that they used to be able to do. They, they have much less pain. Um, it, it can provide a very uh, meaningful solution for the pain uh, when used appropriately. In less than a minute, if there's one thing for prevention of back pain, what do you recommend, Adil? So, uh, I think I think I would have to uh, cheat you on that answer there. I would say a few things. I would say you want to make sure that you're in shape. Try to avoid excess weight. So if you're carrying more weight, you're putting more stress on your body, whether, it's de whether that causes degeneration or injury to your body. Number two, don't go into sports or exercise suddenly. Make sure you gradually build it. A lot of people injure their back because they do sudden movements or movements they are not used to. Number three, make sure you work on your core. Those are the muscles in your abs and your back. And that's very important very cool. nowadays because yeah. of so modern technology. Often comes down to diet and exercise and staying active and being healthy. Thank yes. you very much, both Thanks. of you. And now for the answer to tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. True or false? Surgery is the most common treatment for chronic back pain. True or false? And the answer is False. We have certainly showcased, I hope, some of the many alternatives to surgery tonight, I'd say. We'll be right back after this. Extra, extra, read the Prairie Doc Perspectives weekly column in your local newspaper. More than 130 newspapers in the region print the newspaper column written by the Prairie Docs, covering a variety of medical and health-related topics. Ask your local paper if they print Prairie Doc Perspectives. Back pain can be disabling not only in terms of employment, but also in terms of other social connections. This point was never more clear to me when I saw a patient named Maria, a 56-year-old experiencing severe low back pain for nearly five years. The pain prevented her from standing or walking for more than five minutes at a time, and it had cost her the job she loved. Maria shared with me her one heart-wrenching goal. She wanted to hold her first grandchild, a six-month baby boy. During that, it caused so much intense pain, it put her in bed for a full week afterwards. 
At our first visit, we discussed the treatment she had exhausted with no relief. Pain pills had severe side effects. She tried numerous steroid injections, which seemed to help for several weeks, but the pain returned, as did her disability. These quick fixes were not only failing to relieve her pain, but were also causing other health issues. She was diagnosed with osteopenia, which is weak bones, and also prediabetes. Both are known risk factors of prolonged steroid use. She'd been told that there were no other options for her. I reviewed her medical history and immediately started noticing a glaring treatment deficit. She had never been to physical therapy. After six weeks of physical therapy and a trial of some basic non-opiate medications, she was able to lose weight and developed a home routine to help decrease the pain significantly. But there was one problem that remained. She could still not pick up her grandchild without severe pain. We ordered new imaging and found arthritis in the small paired joints in the back of the lumbar spine, plus an inflammatory disc and bone problem in the front of the lobe back structure. This is a well-known phenomenon that is called modic end plate changes. For perhaps the first time, Maria received a full explanation of her images and learned exactly what was causing her pain. Shortly after, we treated her low back pain from her L4 and L5 modic changes with an outpatient, minimally invasive procedure which targets the basi vertebral nerve. This treatment has the potential to provide a permanent cure for pain related to this very specific problem. Maria's recovery process was mostly anesthesia related and she had 80% relief of the pain within two weeks of the procedure. At her three month follow up, she had tears of joy as she told me how wonderful it was to hold her now one year old grandson. This is why I'm a pain doctor, not only to relieve pain, but to restore function and to help patients achieve a basic life goal. Life is about the little things that most of us take for granted, whether it's standing, walking, or holding our grandkids. A big thank you to our guests, Tyler and Adil, for volunteering their time and experience to help us learn more about back pain and its treatments. If you would like more information about this program or to see and hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube or visit us at prairiedoc.org. And be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever you get your podcasts. That does it for tonight from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. It's been called our body's most underrated organ, and we need to hear what it's telling us. Listen to your gut next time on Call with the Prairie Doc. We all want people to have the ability to make appropriate decisions about their health care. To do so, they need access to information from reliable sources, like our Prairie Docs and their guests. Hello, I'm Stephanie Herseth Sandlin, and I serve on the Volunteer Board of Directors for the Healing Words Foundation, a 501c3 organization established by Rick and Joni Holm. The foundation accepts gifts from those of you who wish to support Dr. Holm's legacy and continue this mission, which is so very important to rural residents and communities across South Dakota and in neighboring states. Please consider a personal or corporate gift. Go to prairiedoc.org to make a donation today. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Monument Health, 
Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, Pier District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Urology Specialists, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Lake Fonset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swift Health Communications.